Hi there, I am the CRM Ninja, and on today's episode of the Oops Factor, I have Justin Carter. Welcome to the show, Justin. Hey, thanks. It's good to be here. It's great to have you on. How are things going? Oh, they're going pretty good. It's never a dull moment, right, in the dynamics world. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that is true. That is true. But I understand it's also not really a dull moment in your life, because in my background, I have a hobby of yours, GP. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. For those who are the uninitiated into such things, can you explain what jeeping is and how the heck you got into it? <laughs> yeah. So uh, jeeping, uh, you know, obviously Jeep is a, a brand of cars, right? And they have like the Jeep Grand Cherokee. Uh, what I have is Jeep Wrangler. And so what we would do is uh, me and a couple, couple friends, we would just go up into the mountains. I live uh, just outside of Boulder, Colorado. And so, you know, we can get to the mountains in about 30 minutes and uh, we just kind of go up as, uh, you know, a couple couple Jeeps. We all have the Wranglers. We have uh, the winches, like you see there on the front. Um, it's a tow cable, which you inevitably get uh, stuck. <laughs> we uh, we go through a number of trails. Um, there's a lot that are out there uh, that are cleared and, and maintained by the, uh, you know, the, the Department of Natural Resources or park rangers. And uh, we'll just all go up there and have fun and you know, explore some interesting trails. And sometimes there's old abandoned mining camps that we'll go and take pictures at. And um, other times we find that there was a, a snowstorm or a mudslide or something and, uh, you know, trees got in the path. So what we'll do is we'll hook up our winch to those trees and try to clear a path so people can still do it. And, um, ah, nice. and inevitably in the winter too, uh, it's kind of a, not really fun. It's more of an emergency thing, but when people get stuck, uh, you know, for one reason or another, when they're you know, going to the mountains to go snowboarding or skiing uh, in the back country, they'll get their car stuck. So, you know, we'll get a text, either I'll get one or a friend will get one. And then we just kind of ping each other like, hey, do you have a boring Saturday? Do you want to go up to the mountains and, uh, you know, free this person uh, who probably was camping out there overnight in their car because they couldn't, you know, get unstuck and then go up there and we're, we're free AAA service. But it's, so, uh, it's fun. So you're like a, a rescue patrol sort of thing for the winter. Yeah, that's what they're called. They're called patrols. It's like groups of jeeps. That is, so. that. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, you know, it's a civil service, you know, that you do for people for that, and that's incredible. Um, but when you're doing, you know, say, clear trails, and obviously clear trees are the way stuff so other people go through, which is obviously, you know, civil service and such. I mean, you're not getting paid for it. But uh, I've seen some videos online of people with jeeps and other stuff. And they go like boulders the size of houses and go up the sides of it all down in crazy angles and backwards and forwards. Is that the sort of thing that you do? Is this like off-roading instead of a BMX as a kid, as a teenager, you now do it as a Jeep and you do that crazy sort of stuff? Or is it just like off-roading casually? Um, so I was pretty casual in the past. I had some other friends that had some great rigs like that one set up is obviously not something you'd buy at a dealership. <laughs> so it's an older model. Uh but um, mine's a 2005 Wrangler JK. Um, and I just recently got it lifted about four inches and in the standard tires, I got 37 inch tires. So they look more like that than what you'd see on the road. Um, so I'm really excited about that, but that was like three weeks ago. So I just bought a standard sport mm -hmm. Wrangler that I would then, you know, do stuff to here and there. Uh, but yeah, anyway, so I got so a lot have, of stuff professionally two done, so. Just one. Oh, just one. Okay. Yeah. But I got a lot of work done on it. So now I can actually do like the big boulder climbing. Right. Uh, so right now I'm redoing our um, downstairs guest bathroom. I'm putting a lot of tile in and cutting it. So my, my hobbies are, are <laughs> trying to get that done first. Uh, and then I'll go back up in the mountains, right. And take on some of the bigger rocks and, you know, you'll put your winch up to an Aspen tree or something. Right. Cause the Aspen trees are all interconnected under the ground. So they're pretty good uh, anchor points. And okay. then um, you can usually get it to climb over a big rock, but you know, it's all about respecting nature. It'll take you out if you're not careful. <laughs> that is, that is right. I guess I'm watching these videos, which, uh, and I don't follow a massive amount of those. I come across them from time to time. But it's always the thing that the thing will roll over and land upside down. And I guess at that point, if you don't have any other vehicles there, you've got problems. Mm -hmm. Yeah, rule of thumb. I mean, there's a lot of rule of thumbs, but um, I won't go out on a trail if you're 
doing, you know, scale of one to 10, right. On difficulty level, everybody right. kind of scales the trails differently. I wouldn't do anything to or above without having at least two or three cars. Um, Cause you do get stuck a lot. So that's half the fun. <laughs> so. guess it defines, I guess it depends on your definition of the word fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so from jeeping and, and the fun that it entails to the oops fact, what do you have to share with us? Oh, just in general. Um, so I was trying to think, because this is the oops factor, right? You know, what are some things that I've oopsed and learned from? Uh, I guess tying it into the the downstairs bathroom, uh, you know, that we're, I'm retiling and I'm doing um, smaller, they're little hexagonal tiles and there's a number of them all kind of put together and you get them in little sheets, right? And then you lay them down. Yeah. Um, I am, I code, I guess, the same way that I do tiling and that I try to be a perfectionist with it. And unfortunately, if, uh, you know, when you, when you have a floor, you even it out and then you put, um, you know, like a, like a mud, essentially it's a, um, it's a mortar and it hardens into like a concrete. And so, you know, you'll trowel it down and, you know, you put these down on the, on top of it, the little sheets of the hexagonal marble, and you try to make sure that it's, it's flat. Well, then when I start putting a couple of them together and I'm like, Ooh, it's not perfect. Right. Then I try fiddling with it a little bit and I'm like, Oh, now it's really not perfect because I screwed something else up. So then I start pulling up the tile. Well, now I got the glue on the back of these hexagonal things that have these little mesh things off. And so now it's really messed up and I'm like, Oh my gosh, that's an oops. Um, so sometimes the pursuit of perfection, uh, you know, much like code, um, can cause a situation where the juice isn't worth the squeeze. <laughs> Sometimes I was enough wondering if you would say that. <laughs> I haven't heard somebody say that in a while. But so, so thank you. So, I mean, you've been, you're not a newbie in the IT space or the consulting space. You've, you've been around the block a couple of times. How many times over the years do you think you've seen situations where people have, you know, try to squeeze so much that it's not worth the juice. You know, they put so much effort into that perfection thing and they've lost sight of, you know, the bigger picture or they just haven't come to appreciate what they've got for it. Yeah, that's a really good, that, that's a really good question. Um, you know, usually this kind of ties into, um, you know, what are the priorities on a given project, right? Is it, is it, you know, minimal viable product? Let's get it out there. Let's deliver it. Um, is it, you know, let's make it perfect so that if we have a thousand test cases, every test case needs to pass, which is usually what everybody says at the beginning. And then once it gets closer to it, you know, they realize that, hey, these five issues, they're probably good enough to get into prod, right? And then in other cases, people say, well, all of these are sev, you know, sev A, critical issues, like, you know, system down if they go into production when really the workaround is like, ah, oh, someone's got to go in once a week and adjust the pricing when we refactor pricing in. You know, we've got a nice Excel add-in with the, the finance and op side. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fairly easy to, to get going. Um, so, you know, you can't lose the forest from the trees in that. If we're using more analogies and, and jeeping stuff, I guess I have forests on the mind. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's important to, to put everything into perspective that, uh, you know, if you have a tile that's maybe off by, you know, one sixteenth of a millimeter and it's bothering you at the time, no one else is probably going to notice it. Um, and over time, maybe it'll smooth out, but you know, the more you kind of fiddle with it to make it absolutely perfect, you may create a one eighth of an inch or a fourth of an inch, uh, kind of gap. So, um, you know, always keeping that front and center. And, and again, you know, having the proper perspective on a project throughout the entire project is important because even if you have the best intentions and, you know, everybody always has that slide, you know, don't pave the cow path, right? We don't want to do what we did before just because it's what we've always done, you know, it doesn't need to be improved upon or, um, you know, let's, let's innovate first and foremost, right? Or, you know, let's just get this live with the minimal viable product. It almost yep. always will shift. Um, people kind of lose the meaning from those sayings over time. That is true. So if you had to think of somebody who was a new to new, newish to consulting or a, a junior developer or something like that, and of course, you get some really bright young things nowadays. I mean, they've been around for ages. There just seem to be more of them now for some reason. Um, and they really do strive for perfection and they'll burn the midnight oil and the 2 a.m. oil and the 4 a.m. oil to get that and such. How would you, what would you tell them? How would you advise them in terms of, you know, where's the place to say, 
enough is enough. You don't need to go further. Perfection is great, but it shouldn't be chased. And and to do it in a yeah. way that is a positive thing rather than just stop there is good enough, where they might feel deflated. Yeah, good good question. Um, I guess from a development standpoint, it would be to properly define the you know the the success criteria before okay. doing an enhancement, and then understanding and categorizing. There's a couple ways to categorize them, right? But I always like to say, hey, if this was Microsoft, you were trying to submit a bug, right? Because one of those things may fail. Um, and it could be because of a system bug and you have to classify it, you know, so. My, Microsoft, wow. whoa, 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 whoa. Microsoft had a bug, so we could <laughs> Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, so, so when you're classifying bugs, I always like to say, hey, let's be consistent, right? Whether it's something that you're analyzing as a, you know, a failure in a, a use case or, um, you know, a unit test in a mod. Um, try to put it in that perspective. Is it a killer? Is it not? Hey, it may be a killer. Maybe it's not. It's not you to decide. It's up to the customer to decide. So, you know, do the best you can in laying it out. And then make sure that communication is very transparent and that um, if you're not, you know, like you said, you know, um, younger developers, they may or may not know and have that perspective, rely on other people. I mean, there's probably going to be people on, on the team, hopefully, that have been doing this for a long time and can tell you, don't worry about that, right? That's not a big deal. You do unit test cases, you could have the simplest mod, but you can have 50 use cases if you go overboard, Right. You know, keep a budget in mind, say like, is it really needed, right? To have that many use cases? Hey, maybe the customer is going to do some stuff, right? Um, let's be good stewards of the, you know, the solution and the, the budget. Um, and I don't know, it's, uh, with that all being said, it's, it's a really tough thing to learn. I think you just got to, you know, run into it a couple of times and then you, you figure it out. Um, True. True. We learn from experience. But there's something that you said a, a minute or two back, which I think is actually really important which a lot of people don't instinctively think about. And that's, you know, if you come across a bug or the customer reports a bug, right? So it's gone there and it's in your team, it's in production, they report and you start working on it. You know, we in our minds say, we need to get this perfect. But you said, get the customer to test it out and to do it. Because it's up to the customer or the client or have you can refer to them as, what did they want versus what do we think is the best thing? Because in the end of the day, it's not really our system. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to think how I could put that back into the tile example, right? Tie it all back. So I guess it would be my wife is ultimately the customer of that bathroom. <laughs> so if she sees something that's off by a 16th of an inch and it's driving me nuts, she like she saw some things in there. I'm like, oh, my gosh, it's the worst. And she's like, oh, I didn't even notice that. You know, but when you're doing it, you notice every little flaw, every detail, yeah. which is not only the mark of a good good craftsman. I'm not a good tile craftsman. I'm not saying that, but I think that anyone who takes a lot of pride in what they do, they always want the best product out of it. And uh, you know, when it comes to coding, you know, most coders they know exactly how their code, um, you know, could or could not fail in you know the millionth scenario. One out of a million times, there could be that one thing that gets through. Do you want yeah. to code for all of that and have a thousand lines of code? Or are you okay having that and having a workaround in place and it only taking, you know, a hundred lines of code. And yeah. then if you went to a thousand lines of code, you know, what's the impact of the system with performance is that extra two seconds to do that process because you coded for that one in a million scenario worth it, or is it better to make it super fast and it gets it right 99% of the time. So, um, yeah, if I'm that one in a million who noticed, you know, that little, you know, one sixteenth gap on the floor because I, you know, I don't know, I <laughs> dropped something and I picked it up and I didn't pat it down or I just overlooked it or I was getting tired, uh, you know, that's on me. I got I got a true perspective on it. True. Well, I think I think with the tile scenario, you know, you're a bit um, you're invested as well because if you tell your wife it's off and you know check and say hey can you come and take a look i don't think it's quite right she says she might find some other stuff and then she'll tell you to replace it all the customer on a project <laughs> is not usually likely you to do such things i mean yeah. you, you you've got to live in the house still and and you know be around that with the bathroom but um you know you're right and especially into, as you said in terms of performance and not just performance i guess but supportability you know when it gets into business as usual and support for it you could code for every single scenario, but it could bloat it out. And then trying to diagnose where a problem is, is very difficult sometimes. Well, and I think that's kind of that school of hard knocks from a dev standpoint. Um, you know, you can code for all the scenarios. And then all of a sudden, after you go live one month, they say, 
oh, the requirements changed. And now to make a change, it's spaghetti code. <laughs> that's, that's, how you, that's how you start putting the, the pasta in the top of that, uh, the pasta maker, right? <laughs> the more that you get, the more difficult it gets. That's true. Actually, it reminds me, actually, I know total, total divert here, but um, all-in-one computers, they're not so much, they, they were the rage about, I don't know, five, 10 years ago, you get like a lovely big screen. I mean, I'm not talking about Macs, I'm talking about PC specifically, right? You know, big screens, HP did them, Lenovo did them, IBM, I think may have done some as well, um, which had a motherboard in the back of them and a hard drive. And when one thing on it went wrong, you had to replace the whole thing because it was all soldered together and it was really difficult to even try and diagnose. Whereas different components, you know, connected together, albeit like a regular desktop computer, so much easier to diagnose problems with. Yeah, uh, you know, on that all in one, I've got to say I had a Surface Book and I think I got it in 2014 and it is still operating like a champ right now. <laughs> it is you a are fantastic blessed. laptop. <laughs> I am. <laughs> you are absolutely blessed because I know some people have had their very opposite experiences with the more modern oh. surfaces. Fair enough. Yep. Um, so that's that. Brilliant. So any any last thoughts you'd give to somebody around the right you know to do or even how they could explain to others because you know you could have a project manager terms of, you know, it has to be absolute perfection we need to do this project to that and they say but but hold on because there's also that change management mindset and and handling people around us like how can we accept that we shouldn't do everything to perfection which can be very difficult sometimes as a mindset to take on yeah no that's a great that's a great point um so staying with the same example right when you're laying tile you're base is like this close to the tile so you can absolutely see every imperfection most of the people are going to be standing up in the room and not even notice it right it's like you know maybe maybe one person who's super finicky right what's the old book the princess and the pea right could feel the pea underneath all those mattresses um most people aren't going to so getting a wider perspective is, is super important on the overall solution right um if you're a developer oftentimes you're like hey i'm working in you know, master planning, or I'm in D365 sales, and this is my area, and it must be perfect. And that's fine. Um, but you know, then you run into these issues where you are looking at that minutia. But if you understand the overall solution, and this is especially important, if you're a, you know, a young dev, or maybe a young functional consultant, and maybe you're doing, you know, a lot of the, the CE apps, uh, you know, all model driven, but you want to dive into canvas apps, right? Or maybe you want to dig into some of the FNO stuff to see how that solution works. And what the Ooh. heck is this crazy thing called dual Ooh. right? Uh, <laughs> you can uh, start envisioning and broadening that perspective. And I guess to me, that would be like standing in the room and using it like an end user, right? So if you're actually in there and you're using it, can you notice that one 16th inch gap on the marble? Or is that really not that big of a deal because there's so much other stuff in the room yeah. that um, you know may or may not have, you know, I don't want to say worse imperfections than that, but uh, maybe there's just so many other things that all come together that the impact of that isn't as big as you think it is. Um, and that maybe speed to market is more important, right? But again, it's it's the customer's decision. So open yeah. transparency with you know your your tech lead, your project manager. Um, you know, the key stakeholders, uh, no one's going to get mad about, you know, one sixteenth of a thing, a tile. Right. But if it's like, oh, no one's going to care that there's a half inch gap with my marble. <laughs> like, oh, well, you might want to ask about that because they may say stop work now and go back and fix it. Right. Um, Very true. So, yeah, transparency. Wonderful. Well, Justin, thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing these marvelous insights into this. Yeah, thanks. It's good talking to you again. It's been a while. It's, it's been great to have you on. Viewers, we hope that you've enjoyed the episode. Feel free to check out the rest of the Ooze Factor playlist. Subscribe to the channel. Take a look at the blog. And if you'd like to come on, hit the link somewhere in the description below. Put in your details, and I'd love to have you on the show. But above all, have an amazing day.